I'm going to move into a different area tonight, and perhaps for the next two or three weeks, and maybe longer, I don't know. If you turn to Malachi, the third chapter, I want to take my text from there, and what the Lord promises here to His people if they will obey. The promise is that we'll be delivered and have discernment. Those two things are promised here, deliverance and discernment. I want to read Malachi 3 and verses 16 to 18. We're going to be dealing with spiritual warfare, deliverance, discernment, and he promises both those things here. Then they that feared the Lord, notice to whom he speaks, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them or deliver them. I will deliver them as a man delivers or spares his own son that serves him. Now they'll be delivered from the fourth chapter judgment. Those who fear the Lord will be delivered. And then, verse 18 is another promise. Then shall ye turn or return and discern. There's discernment. And discern between the righteous and the wicked. And between him that serves the Lord and him that serveth him not. Now, what we're going to be dealing with is some studies in deeper discernment and deliverance. Some things that we have not dealt with before. We're going to go deeper in some areas. Now, the point is that overcomers are promised here deliverance and discernment. We want to meet the test, and that is fear the Lord. Now, to fear the Lord, surely we don't have to digress after all these years and say that means obey the Lord. You know, people who don't obey the Lord don't fear the Lord. So he's saying those who, well, do everything that God requires, and you do that out of godly fear, You see, God is going to bring overcomers into perfection, but He's not going to do it just the way that you might think, by just saying, well, I overcame this temptation, or I overcame the world, or whatever. But there are things that are in us from birth that you pick up from your parents by inheritance, Things that you pick up in the world, in the Antichrist secular educational system. Because certainly it isn't Christ who's teaching that man, you know, came from a zoo. Because his word says we're hastening to the zoo if we don't, you know, get straightened out. That's where man's headed. Things you pick up, you know, through education and the erroneous religious teaching. If you've had any at all, why, a good part of it has been wrong, as you've already discovered since getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Things you pick up through marriage relationships are children from, you know, the family relationship. And on and on and on. There are areas that have never been touched in most lives yet. And the Lord is, as He brings us into perfection, He's revealing more and more how to discern where we need to get rid of something or get delivered from something, really, is what we're talking about. Discern that so you can deal with it. Now, there's a place for the prayer of deliverance, but remember, this church and these studies, like the studies in the deeper life or faith, are instructions to enable you or each of us to take back the ground that we've yielded to the powers of darkness in some area. And to be able to discern for ourselves when maybe a multiple personality is talking out of us or through us. Now, as I say, we're going to go deeper. We're not trying to arouse suspicions, but discernment. We just have to wait till we get to it. What we're saying is, though, we're going to be dealing with the devil, demons, and discernment and deliverance because that's what really he's dealing with here in Malachi. Well, it will become clear as we go through it. Some terminology may sound a little familiar, but we're going to be dealing with it with more discernment and depth to show you how to avoid some of the snares that Adam and Eve fell into, and Adam and Eve is still falling into the same snares. He always makes something so attractive to you, or he will 
plant fear in your heart or he will get you to use your logic and things will begin to turn out all wrong and yet you claim to be a Christian baptized in the Spirit and an overcomer and yet why isn't this area of my life working out as it should? Or what's the matter here in the home or the business or church or whatever? It's because there are areas that haven't been touched yet. And we need more discernment. As I say, you may know some terminology we'll use occasionally. Some of it you won't know because it'll be new, just like multiple personality. That's a term psychiatrists use to mean there are various levels of consciousness that manifest themselves in some of their clients or patients. Some have been discerning enough to know that there are different personalities talking through the same individual But since they don't believe in demons or demon possession, they say these are not entities, these are various levels of consciousness. Because of fright or fear, or a child may have been molested at four or five years of age, they open the door to spirits, but the psychiatrist or psychologist, he'll call this a certain level of personality. We know it as entities that have to be dealt with. But most don't know how to discern when another spirit's talking to them. I've seen it time and again, other spirits talking to me. Sometimes I've interrupted the person and I say, that is a spirit of pride or fear or lust or rebellion or whatever it was manifesting talking to me now. And they look at you like, you know, they weren't aware of that, but it's a spirit. Well, as we get over to that, it'll become clear And you'll see there are areas that not only where you can help yourself, but help others. If you know how to discern, you see, most people think that control by a spirit means you fall in the floor and you writhe and you foam at the mouth. Oh, they're demon possessed. But the more subtle forms of control, most people, because they don't have the experience or discernment or whatever or study of the word, Don't detect that that's a spirit working sometimes in and through a person and another personality is actually talking through that person, but they so identify with that personality that only people who are knowledgeable, and I don't mean up here, but knowledgeable in the word and through experience can discern that as another spirit talking. But as I say, that will clear up as we come. Now, he speaks here in Malachi 3, 16 to 18, of those who fear the Lord will be spared the judgments to come or delivered, which sparing or delivering will be to deliver you out of everything that would hinder you from entering into the blessings here that will come upon those who fear the Lord. He goes on in chapter 4 and says they will be blessed when... The son of righteousness rises. But anyway, they will be spared or delivered and will have the discernment to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, which is a big problem right now. Well, what is right or what is wrong? And whose ministry is valid? Is Brother Freeman right saying that JDS is a heresy? It violates, to say the least, the Old Testament types of sacrifice. Or are these JDS teachers right? Who is right or wrong? Who are the righteous? Who are the wicked? Who is, he says, serving the Lord? You'll be able to discern who's serving the Lord and who's serving self or Satan. Some golden calf ministry like the Babylonian religion or denominationalism, whatever term you want to use. Serving self, Satan, man's established religion. Most people can't discern that one. They think everything religious is from God, you know. If it sounds all right to their ear. So if there was ever a time in history and ever an area where professing Christians are gullible and a lot professing to be overcomers are not perceptive and not discerning, it's in the area of religion. They know all about how to send a man to the moon and you've got computers in your home now. You don't even have to know how to bake a cake anymore. You just look at the computer and it'll give you the time and temperature and ingredients and whatever. I'm saying we know how to do everything, but... When we get in the religious realm, very few are really discerning. They lack discernment. I'm talking about true Christians and sincere overcomers, that is, those who sincerely want to overcome. Well, it's shocking how much there is lacking in discernment in the religious and spiritual area. Non-charismatics will follow anything that has a denominational stamp on it, almost anything. Just put the denominational stamp on it, it's all right. If it doesn't have that, oh... That's not God. And let's come against that. But the charismatic will follow almost any one. If he can work a miracle and prophesy. 
seemingly oblivious to the fact that there are two sources, as you well know by now, there are two sources for these things without even going into it. Why, the Bible itself says devil and antichrist and false prophets work miracles. That's all through the Word, Old and New Testament. Deuteronomy 13, if a prophet works a sign, a miracle, and it comes to pass, so he already said he can do it, but if he turns you from the true God to other gods, then you don't go by the miracle, you go by the message. So, as I say, all through the Bible, Old and New Testament, there are two sources. And we know anyway, in our day, that multitudes are following all sorts of, well, whatever is supernatural or charismatic, for the most part, will follow it. And whatever has a denominational label on it, uh, non-charismatic will follow. Just to mention some of the obvious, the Babylonian bondage of denominationalism. Most follow that. Most follow that in religion. The JDS heresy, that Jesus became a sinner, had to be born again in hell of all places. The shepherdship bondage, where Jesus is no longer your covering and his blood. The religious cults like the way which is charismatic. And somebody said they're using some of your books. And yet it's off, you see. It's not of God. Just a little study of that will show it. And think of the multitudes of people that are sacrificing millions of dollars to build a city of doubt out in the West. You know where? That's going to glorify the God of medical science and rob Jesus of all that his pain and suffering procured for us at Calvary. And those who are swallowing the poison of the faith of presumption delusion that you can't believe the word of God, you can't take a promise and believe it and claim it in Jesus' name, you have to get a special revelation. I've just recently listening to a tape out of Canada, and it's made its way all the way up there, this teaching that you can't take a literal promise. That's just the logos. You've got to wait for a harema as you pray. And you know the whole story. It's on tape. If you don't, you can get that. But that's robbing charismatics because non-charismatics don't believe the promises anyway. That can't even be gainsaid or debated. But robbing charismatics of their faith in the Word of God and their blessings. And charismatic teachers who are denying the blood atonement. I've got a letter in my files by a leading charismatic teacher. The blood doesn't atone. And another one I have in my file, denying the eternal sonship of Christ. They're following ministers who entertain them one Sunday with magic in the pulpit, and the next Sunday they're deluding them, planting fear in their heart, ministering fear to them, telling them they better stockpile food, dehydrated food for the worldwide food crisis that's soon to come. Well, Jesus predicted that it would come, but he had something to say about not stockpiling. He said to trust Him in your faith. And on and on and on. People are just following everything. You know, even some of them starting to carry guns now because they may need to protect themselves against the communists or the Illuminati when they take over. <laughs> if you're going to be one of these here in Malachi 3 that is delivered, that is spared, you're going to have to do better than, I hate to say it, but most. <laughs> For visitors' sake, many. But we know most, you'll have to do better than most and develop some discernment. Now, a familiar passage, of course, is 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, where we are told in the latter days, the Spirit speaks expressly, in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith. Why? Because they give heed to seducing spirits in the doctrines of demons. 1 Timothy 4, 1, familiar passage in this church. And in view of what God is warning here in 1 Timothy 4, 1, which is already coming to pass, then we better develop some discernment and know how to deliver ourselves and others because the devil has come down in great wrath, as it were, because he knows his time is short and has unleashed a great horde of demonic spirits against the world. And as we pointed out Wednesday night, I believe, the problem is that most in the churches, charismatic or non-charismatic alike, would never be able to detect the presence and activity of demonic spirits unless they appeared to them, you know, like that picture on the cans of deviled ham in the grocery store. They seem to be totally unaware of what we're told about the way the devil works and appears in Second Corinthians 11. He doesn't appear like that. Deviled ham to the contrary. He appears, we're told, as an angel of light. 
Most seem to be unaware of that. They think, you know, if he isn't red and have horns and a forked tail and a pitchfork, it couldn't be the devil. Oh, his ministers, he has his own apostles who appear, Paul says, as ministers of Christ. They don't say they're ministers of error or heresy or deception. But, of course, that's what they are. And most people seem to be ignorant of the fact that this great host of demonic spirits that's unleashed against the world is causing all of these things they call by other names. You know, the increase in disease and mental illness and crime and sexual perversion and the rioting and the rebellion, not just by the youth, but by the women and the children and all of the media inspired anarchy. Much of the anarchy throughout the world is media inspired. You know, if there's nothing happening, it's not news. If it isn't negative, it's not news. And so they will manufacture something. Well, I wonder what this means. I wonder this or that or the other. And they get people to speculating. Well, wonder what will happen. Will they strike or won't they strike? Or will this nation invade that one or won't they? And they're always speculating when there's no news about what might happen. And, of course, they can talk it into existence sometimes. But anyway, according to 1 Timothy 4, 1, those who depart from the faith, and notice he didn't say depart from religion, they just depart from the Bible. Those who depart from Bible faith, he says they do so because they're listening, like some, even a faith assembly have, to seducing spirits. And their teaching, which he terms here doctrines of demons. You see, if the doctrine isn't from God, there's only one other source. Anybody ought to see that, but they don't. If it doesn't line up with the Word, there's only one other source. I don't care how pious or what office he holds. The one who speaks it. He may have been a genuine prophet, but when he starts making Jesus a pervert and a sodomite and a drunkard and a liar and a blasphemer and a deceiver and all of the other 10,000 things they say he had to become... He's no longer a prophet of God. I don't care what he was before. Because that is so sick that I don't see how they can frame the words to even call him that. And he went to hell, served the devil, three days was under the devil's control, and God had to be born again. God had to be born again. I mean, it's ludicrous, besides blasphemous. How can God be born again? And if you get his human nature born again and not the Logos, then you've divided him up. And there's no way you can separate the eternal Logos who became Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he'll remain that for eternity. He's the God-man on the throne right now at the right hand of God. Well, you know about those things, but if the doctrine isn't from God, then who's it from? You say a man. No, no man could dream that one up. That came out of the pit. And a lot of other things came out of the pit, like work salvation and merry worship and bowing down to the saints and praying to the saints and bowing down before statues and transubstantiation and that Jesus was just a prophet like Mohammed and on and on and on. No, no man dreamed those up. They come out of the pit. Well, we want to move in now to some deeper insights into spiritual warfare. We'll be giving you some clues as to discernment and then how to deal with it. There's no point in telling you, you know, what it is if we don't tell you what to do about it. And so I'm going to deal with these things under various categories. It's going to be more of a teaching sort of study tonight and over the next few weeks or however long it lasts. God, as I say, is going to enable us to overcome, but He isn't going to do it just by listening to sermons, but we're going to have to see areas where we have to crucify things in our life. That's the deeper life message. Areas where we're going to have to start exercising faith and not hope. Get the faith out of the head and the heart. That's the faith message. And areas where we need to discern that something is hindering our growth. Or something is manifesting in a child's life or a husband or wife or an employer or an employee or a friend or whatever that... Now you can see is another entity that needs to be dealt with. Well, you can't always deal with it in somebody else, but the point is just saying, well, he has odd behavior occasionally. It just comes and goes. Well, maybe it is an odd behavior if it comes and goes. Maybe it's a manifestation of a multiple personality. In fact, it is often. So we're going to deal first with the work of demons versus the works of the flesh. 
The work of demons versus the works of the flesh. Now, as we've already taught you, many, many people confuse the two. They will come to us for deliverance from something that they need to crucify in their life. We have to be able to discern the difference between the works of the devil, the works of demons in one's life, and the works of the flesh. You can't crucify a demon, as we've taught you. You can't cast out the flesh. Now, if you will, let's turn over to Galatians 5 and remind ourselves again of what he describes in this catalog as works of the flesh. And then we'll take off from there. We need to remind ourselves again what works of the flesh are. Galatians 5 and verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. Manifest means you see them all the time, don't you? Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Notice those first four are sexual impurity. Idolatry, witchcraft or sorcery, the occult, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, JDS, envings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And he said, I've told you that they who do such things shall not enter the kingdom of God. That ought to put the fear of God in overcomers. Hey, I better not get involved. Envy? My, my, my. I didn't know envy was there. Strife? Well, I thought we were supposed to defend our rights or defend truth in the courts of law if necessary and so on. Well, we'll be dealing with that one Wednesday night in our studies in Corinthians. But here we have not all of the works of the flesh by any means, but some of the more outstanding ones that the Spirit wanted us to know about. Now, every one of these sins termed here works of the flesh, that's what they are, works of the flesh, I have encountered over the years in my ministry as spirits also. You see what I'm saying? Every one of the works of the flesh I've dealt with in people are encountered as a demon, are spirits. Thus, the obvious necessity of our having to be able to discern the difference. To know when it's a spirit of lust, for example, or a lust of the flesh. And there is a big difference. You see, you can command the devil all day long. But if you have given in to some of these sins he catalogs here, like fornication, strife, envy, just to name a few, if you have given in to them due to a lack of self-control, you can command the devil all day long to no effect. You're not going to be helped. Because you see, obviously, it's a matter of a lack of self-control on your part. These are works of the flesh. I don't see why anybody has to come for deliverance from a spirit of pride or envy or fornication that's committed once or they got proud that they had a new car and they drove around the block sufficiently till everyone noticed it. But that isn't their modus operandi. That isn't the way they act all the time. But, you know, a manifestation of pride or God gave me all A's. You see, old flesh wants to say all A's. I made all A's. I made all A's. But the Spirit says, God gave me all A's. That's the way I tell it because I got all these in college. But I was a high school dropout. See who gets the glory? He didn't have the smarts. I didn't know the difference between a dangling participle and a split infinitive that I keep saying, you know, we hear from other people. I hear it on the radio all the time. They're always splitting infinitives and ending sentences with prepositions and using nouns in places of adverbs and all that. But I didn't know that in 1952. He taught me all that. He taught me enough I can write books and correct others' speech. But he did it. Why do we have to run for deliverance from something? Just because there was a manifestation of it. But if, after you've done all you can, and you know because of persistence in a certain area of sin, pride, envy, fornication, or whatever, you've opened the door to spirits and you need deliverance. 
Now let me hasten to add that one sin sometimes in some of the worst cases of possession and people needing deliverance is just one contact with something. But generally people who get under the control and deep influence inside their spirits, their bodies and spirits, are people who persist in some area of sin. You know, resentment or hate. And then, you know, over a period of years, they need deliverance from resentment or hate. And that's why they're not getting a healing. We're talking about charismatics now who believe in it, to use an example. Generally, it doesn't happen just one contact, but it can and it does too often. So don't say, well, I only did this or that once, and so I don't need deliverance. That isn't what determines whether or not you need deliverance. Whether or not you need deliverance, have you given that up? Have you repented of that? Is it a thing that just happened and you know that's all it was and you weren't opening yourself to some spirit? Or have you done all you know to do and you can't get rid of it? It's just there. You just struggle with it and nothing happens. You may get worse. Then you need deliverance. It's that simple, if that's simple. Because people who can help themselves don't need deliverance, you know, just by self-control. And after all, that's what we're called to be and to do, to be self-controllers. Control self, not control others, as everyone likes to do, but control yourself. Now, let me hasten to add, if you're one that needs deliverance, as we teach you here, as our literature and tapes teach you, that doesn't mean to run to some minister for deliverance. Because what are you going to do the next time you need deliverance and you're off in Guatemala or somewhere? And there's nobody that even knows what you're talking about when you say you need deliverance. You've got to learn to deliver yourself. So because we say there are indications and ways to discern whether or not you need deliverance, that doesn't mean you run for deliverance because you need deliverance. Deliver yourself. That's what we teach. And we know there are cases where people can't deliver themselves. We're not talking about those. We're teaching overcomers. And where the tape and literature goes out, we're not talking to novices. And I deal with people like on the phone or in the study that they don't know anything about occult participation or deliverance or whatever, you know. And so you have to just start at the beginning and you help them. You have to show them certain steps. I was dealing with a situation recently over the phone where I talked to the husband on two different occasions and the wife got on and talked to me and says, he hasn't changed. He did what you said, but only because I required it. I required it, yeah. And so on, so on, so on. I said, well, he doesn't want deliverance. Well, she said, that's it. See, she had never clued in on that. She wondered why, you know, no change. Well, I said he doesn't want deliverance. When he wants deliverance, he'll be delivered. Because he says he's a Christian, and that's the basis. We always start with that. We're not talking about people who don't know anything. You know some things. And most of the people who hear the tapes and read the literature know some things. So deliver yourself. God wants you to see how to take back the ground you've yielded over the years, or maybe just through that one experience, to the devil. And then keep the door closed. The question is, how do we discern which it is, whether it's a fleshly lust or a spirit of lust? Well, as we said, if it's a driving compulsion, if you've done all you can, and generally most haven't, we mean by all you can, resorting to prayer, fasting. We're talking to Christians, not people who can't do these things, or if they could, they wouldn't have any effect. Have you resorted to prayer? Have you resorted to fasting? Have you resorted to learning the word and memorizing certain deliverance promises? I can do all things through Christ or to the devil. You have no place in me. Jesus said that once to the devil. You have no part in me. Yet we're taught that for three days the devil had part in him. But anyway... Staying in the Word, exercising faith. Have you done all you know to do? Well, if you have, and there's no permanent change or victory, you need deliverance. It's that simple. But you see, most people don't exercise self-control. They won't pay the cost of getting in the Word. They want a shortcut. So when they hear me say, if you've done all you know to do, you need deliverance, right away they will call, or they will write, or they will come all the way, I mean, thousands of miles sometimes, dear friends, to faith assembly to get delivered with no intention 
of exercising self-control and dealing with the cause, they want deliverance from the problems that are being caused by the invasion of spirits or the influence and control of spirits. And so by this time, don't think when we say you need deliverance, that means run for deliverance. That means deliver yourself. Pay the cost. Now, we recognize, too, it's like when you're preaching on healing, and if God anoints with the gifts, it's not a lack of faith for you to come and get under the anointing if you want to and get a healing manifested. It happens many, many times. We've seen feet straightened out, babies with feet turned in, infections by the score, I guess, there's no exaggeration, healed, and on and on. And if we're preaching on deliverance and the Lord anoints and he just made a pray for some or certain types of deliverance. And if you have the faith and desire, get in under the anointing. But we're talking about the long-range view, the long-term attitude you should have. Not that night that we taught on deliverance and you came and got delivered. We're talking about you getting the discernment. And I'm not talking about discernings of spirits. That's a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. I'm talking about discernment that God's talking about here in Malachi. So you can discern between right and wrong. And those ministers who are serving the Lord and those who are serving self or Satan. The long range. So that you can keep the ground that you had yielded and now you took back from the enemy. So you can keep the door closed. If you would learn to be as hard on yourself when we teach you on faith or deeper life or deliverance, if you'd just learn to be as hard on yourself as you want me to be on the devil when I pray for you for deliverance, then you would need to come for deliverance. And that's true 99% of the time. Over in James 4 and verse 7, James says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He didn't say run for deliverance from the devil. But you resist, and he'll flee from you. Now, I want you to notice in Galatians 5.19 that the first four of these works of the flesh are also sins in the flesh. We're talking about discerning between the works of the flesh and the works of spirits. The first four works of the flesh are in the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Now, after you've discerned... Whether this is a fleshly lust, since that's the first things he mentions, sexual uncleanness, after you've discerned whether it's a lust of the flesh or a spirit of fleshly lust, and I just showed you how to discern that, can you remember that? Can you overcome it by self-control, by prayer, by fasting? Sometimes that's needed. By the Word of God. Can you overcome it by faith? If you cannot... If you feel yourself controlled, and I've had people that are controlled, they said, I just cannot overcome this. It's a spirit. Then you need deliverance. So after you've discerned whether it's a lust of your flesh or a fleshly spirit of lust, then you need to know how to deal with it. How do you deal with it? You deal with it either by self-control or deliverance, I've already said, but that doesn't tell you how to get rid of the problem Getting rid of the problem, you have to deal with the source, not the effect. The effect is your problem that you're having, our problems, plural. But you have to deal with the source. Now, as I just said up in verse 19 of Galatians 5, these sins of the flesh, works of the flesh, are sins in the flesh. And so, since you have to deal with the source, then the door are the source to their manifestation is always in the mind or the thought realm. There are just some things that are not going to get you delivered, some actions you take unless you know where the source is, where you're opening the door. And the door to sins in the flesh are not in the flesh. The flesh is neutral. Like when you're asleep, you're not out fornicating, committing adultery, uncleanness or lasciviousness are not being manifest. So obviously the sin, the source, the door to the manifestation of fleshly sins are in the mind. And you have to deal with the mind. You can fast and you can pray and you can come for deliverance and you can get counseled. And you can make all sorts of resolutions. But if you don't deal with the source, then the door is still open. It's just like when we're dealing with the occult. 
we have to show people they've opened a door and they have to close that. Say they played with a Ouija board or visited a fortune teller. It isn't enough to know they've got problems, migraine headaches, or have turned homosexual from a normal heterosexual person. They have to know why that happened. And so we show them we've been able to help. The Lord has been able to help through the literature and ministries of this body. Help multitudes of people to come out from under the control and influence of spirits where they open the door. Now we're talking about though a special kind of spirit. If you discern, you see that it is a lust of the flesh, then you deal with self-control. If you discern that it's something that you cannot control, whatever means you take, then you have to deal with a spirit. But you still have to come back to the source, and that is to deal with the mind. If you feed your mind on erotic literature, and people do, not always Playboy, there are just a lot of magazines and booklets and novels and things that are more erotic than Playboy. Not that I am that much of a authority on what's in Playboy. You can be aroused through the marriage manuals. The marriage manuals today are nothing but sex books. Even so-called Christian ones, but I'm thinking especially of those that are so explicit with all of their pictures and all. If you feed your mind on erotic literature, those fleshly images will keep floating up from your subconscious, even while you're praying sometimes. And so you've got to deal with the source. Quit feeding your mind on erotic literature. Are your eyes on the trashy vision, which, as I said, we abbreviate TV. Because, you see, if you're going to do this, then you open yourself either to the lusts of the flesh, because the Bible, and Paul here in Galatians 5, speaks of the lusts of the flesh. He's not talking about demons or spirits. He does that in other places. So you, by feeding your eyes, the eye gate, the ear gate, your mind on that through the eye and ear gate, then you see you open yourself either to lusts of the flesh or spirits of fleshly lust. And that takes you back to how to discern the difference. We've already told you that. But it isn't enough just to discern which it is, whether it's a lust of the flesh or a spirit of lust. But what you have to do is close the door to that area of carnality that's in the mind. Or you'll never be delivered. Because the flesh will lust on the basis of the images in the mind. The flesh does not lust on its own. What would be the point? The flesh is neutral. It can't go anywhere till you tell it. can't do a thing till you tell it. And the tongue, remember, is a part of your fleshly body. That's why the Bible spends so much time saying, you know, self-control of the tongue. The whole third chapter of James and so on. You've got to close the door to that area of carnality that's in your mind. In other words, don't fill your mind with fleshly images, and they can't be there. Don't you wish you could do some things over that you were involved in out there in the world? Do they ever come floating back into your consciousness and you say, Oh God, that's under the blood. I don't even want to think about it. Where did that thought come from? Well, if you're human and you're over four years of age, you probably have some idea of what we're talking about. I mean, God made us all the same way. Males and females with normal desires and so forth and so on. And things that happened in the world, you see, can come creeping back in. Well, why after you become a Christian and yet spirit-filled, would you still spend your time before the trashy vision, reading the erotic literature, looking at the pictures... Or whatever. What I'm saying is, dear friends, if you fill your mind with fleshly images, then you're opening yourself to the lust of the flesh or spirits of lust. And I've encountered both. First thing I generally ask people who are dealing with lust, and it's not just men by any means in this end time. <laughs> Maybe the percentage is the other way for all I know because I've dealt with so many, but it's certainly about 50-50. First thing I ask them, do you watch Trashy Vision? <laughs> Trashy Vision? <laughs> oh, it's abbreviated today. TV, Hollywood movies. What do you read, I ask them. You see, I go right at the heart of it. And as often as not, it's what they look at, what they watch. 
I could mention some books that you thought were neutral, like marriage manuals and Sears Roebuck catalogs and whatever. When I was growing up, you would only see that on a burlesque stage. In fact, even less. That now is just the norm. What comes through the eye gates, what you've got to watch or watch out for? Whether it's trashy vision, Hollywood movies, or what you see at the beach, or so I said Wednesday, you don't have to go to the beach. So many times now, I just have to keep eye contact with people I'm talking to. So many times now, I just have to keep eye contact with people I'm talking to. You don't dare let your eyes stray because of the way they're dressed. No, undressed. And you know, it's a spirit. It's an unclean spirit. Marriage manuals, catalogs. You have to watch what comes through the eye gate. I don't recommend you go to the beach. I just said, you know, that there it's almost total nudity anymore. And of course, some countries it's even worse than here, but it'll get here. And so you have to so often just make eye contact with people or don't look at all. If I'm driving, generally I just drive anymore because if you're trying to take in the sights, the beauty of the trees, the oak trees and the squirrels and the birds and all, you've got all of this perversion coming into view. Well, if you say, you know, sin is in the eye of the beholder, I don't find that verse in Scripture that had to come from some secular philosopher or porno peddler or whatever who wanted to sell his books and not be, you know, condemned because of it. But I've discovered what they're doing. I couldn't figure out why anybody would want to show as much as they're trying to show. And as I say, it's not that you're looking, you just have to shut your eyes. Because you spend half your time looking away. But the point is, I was in a restaurant, a cafeteria, not too long ago. And I just happened to look. And I mean, two grown girls in their early 20s. They might as well have not worn any clothes. It was that bad. Now, I wasn't looking, but you couldn't help. They don't show just their legs anymore. They were showing almost the whole bottoms. And I discovered what they're doing, the males and females, they're buying the athletic shorts and they're buying them two to three sizes too small. Oh, ho. And you know what happens? Not just what comes through the eye gate, but the ear gate. What you hear on the radio or listening as some do to so-called Christian rock. There's no such thing as Christian rock, contradiction of terms. The only Christian rock is Jesus. <laughs> That is what they mean. It has the same secular beat. All they've done is add some religious words, and I'll tell you, there's about as much spiritual death than most of the words they add. All they've done, though, is added some religious words to the secular rock beat, and I'll tell you, it's just as hard rock as you'll hear in any nightclub that you hear in churches today. So you have to watch what you listen to, because that beat... And as we say in our book, Every Wind of Doctrine, and as they admit, you hear it all the time, I heard it recently, rock is sex. Rock is a music, it's sex. It's designed to give you that jungle beat and stimulate you to go out and fornicate. That's what it's for, and they admit it. And demons take control, so you have to watch what you listen to. But here's an area where you may not have thought about, and that's conversation. Are you aware the Bible says we need to be careful what we say and what we listen to that others are saying? I'd like for you to look at two passages in the same epistle. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, and that it may minister grace to your hearers. There are just some things husbands and wives don't need to talk about. Do you know what I heard today? I don't want to know what you're doing. You know, if it's something that will cause a fleshly image to be seeping up to my consciousness a week later, a month later, or a year later, you know of what I speak. Then over in chapter 5 and verse 12, he said, It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done by the wicked people in secret. Back to verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. We shouldn't be talking about them. And yet, you know as well as I do, ministers even, as well as Christians, will get together and talk about things 
how women, you know, sometimes throw themselves at you. It's amazing things that go on. Or how one woman told one of the ministers in this body, she said, I've really had to overcome lust because every time I look at you, you know, there's no modesty anymore. Do you know that? And tales, you know about what went on in the motel. No, I don't want to hear about it. If it doesn't involve this church, I don't want to hear about all the details of what went on in a case of incest or rape or fornication or adultery or uncleanness or lasciviousness. There's just some things better left unsaid. He said, don't even talk about these things. He says, it's a shame to talk about what they do out there. The works of darkness. You know what he's talking about. Uncleanness and whatever else. And recently there was a case where we were dealing with a situation with a young man and some were concerned that he needed deliverance in some areas, you know, of lust and so forth. I won't give the details because if I don't personalize it, then the person, if he hears this, he can't object. But one of the charges against him was by a young lady that said he called me up and was telling me all of his problems, and then he began to get very explicit about his sexual problems, tendencies toward homosexuality and other sexual problems. And she said, I had to cover my mind with the blood to listen to him. Well, she should have covered her ears and just hung up. Never seems to occur to people that they shouldn't be listening to that, especially male to female. It's bad enough when two ministers get together and talk about what happened in their meeting where somebody was making advances. Don't even talk about those things. All they do is minister images to the mind that are going to arise later. You know of what we speak because it's in the thought realm. And then the eye gate, as we've been mentioning. This was the ear gate that Paul's dealing with here. But the eye gate. Matthew 5, Jesus said the eye gate can become a source of a violation of one of the commandments, adultery, through the eye gate. He said you don't have to commit the act. He said you can lust after a woman or vice versa in the mind. And he said you have committed the act of adultery. God charges it, puts it on the books as an act of adultery. And so don't fall into the snare of buying the marriage manuals you see advertised. Don't fill your mind with that. Whatever you need to know about the marriage relationship, God will show you. Now, I'm just going to differ with all of this sex education in the school. In fact, I do in my book, Every Wind of Doctrine. All it does is lead to experimentation by the little ones, and they are experimenting, and it hasn't proven to have done anything but increase promiscuity, and venereal disease and illegitimate babies, all of this freedom of sex education and so forth. And I'm certainly not opposed to a mother talking to a daughter or a father or son. Most of the time they don't, but I don't want them taught in school because the parents are negligent at some point. And so don't fall into this buying the manuals, how to teach your children about sex or marriage manuals, all the positions and all of that. You know what is advertised. And I dare say some of you may have to go home after these studies and do a little house cleaning because you thought it was all right. Well, I'm married, and it says marriage manual, and how to be a Christian and have sex without guilt. Throw that garbage in the garbage. You don't need that. All that's going to do is minister lust to you. Lust of the flesh. And I'm not burying my head in the sand because the Bible doesn't bury its head in the sand. It says Adam knew Eve, his wife, and they had a son. Well, that's pretty explicit. Nothing wrong there. I don't want to digress into some of the terminology that I do here today. Well, I will digress. I believe the Spirit wants me to digress. Dear friends, when you give testimonies, you don't have to be that explicit. It's one thing, you know, when you're under the anointing and you're warning and you're teaching because these things are happening, the uncleanness and the perversion and all of that. And people are trying to excuse oral sex, saying it isn't sodomy, when it's the basic form of sodomy. But anyway, we have to be a little explicit sometimes. But when you're giving a testimony... And I've heard things like, well, I've claimed by faith my husband will let me back in the bedroom. Oh, come on. 
Modesty would require that you don't have to say things like that. He's expressing his anger because you come to faith assembly or whatever. He's sleeping by himself. Well, I've claimed by faith he's going to let me back in the bedroom. For what? You see, is what is implied. And then sometimes go on and say that I'll get pregnant. And I'm claiming that God will restore my womb. And on and on and on. And friends, I just can't help the fact that I wasn't reared that way. You don't have to be that explicit. I couldn't imagine one of my three daughters or my wife getting up here in public and talking about her womb. And the nipples on her breast. That's just not modesty. Because when I hear those things, I have to look away from the woman. Because the woman is getting too explicit. All you have to do is say, praise God, I'm with child. Not, well, I'm pregnant. That is such an uncouth, unsophisticated way to express that miracle and blessing that's coming from heaven that you got pregnant. Just say, praise God, he's blessed us with another child. We expect him or her in January, whatever. They're just ways of expressing yourself, is all I'm saying. And I'm not trying to bind you because, again, we don't have a set of rules on how to give testimonies. But in a congregation this big, you get some, I would call them bloopers. <laughs> I have to be explicit to try to help some of you, but don't tell us how long you've been trying <laughs> to get pregnant. Or how long you've been trying to have, and I mean this because we hear it a bowel movement. It's in the minority, but modesty demands that we be just a little less explicit when we're talking about the miracle of conceiving. That's a good term. The Bible uses that. It doesn't say Eve got pregnant. I mean, horses and cows, okay, but you have conceived. Next testimony time, if you let us know you're pregnant, then we're not going to send you a letter. <laughs> we're just trying to help. There are just some things you don't want to talk about. And the marriage manuals and the things you know, and I didn't say throw away your Sears and Roebuck catalog, but there are sections I skip. I've never seen anything so explicit under the guise of selling, you know, underclothes. Well, anyway, I trust there are no visitors and especially no media here tonight, or we've had it. <laughs> you can't even own a Montgomery Ward's catalog. <laughs> oh, it's a sin to go to Sears. Well... <laughs> We'll just have to live with it, but overcomers know where we're coming from. <laughs> yeah, we have all the Sears catalogs and Montgomery Wards and a few others. And you don't, what I want to say too in the area of the ear and eye gate, don't fall into that snare that some do of getting literature or listening to things under the guise that you want to become more knowledgeable in these areas. You don't know much about it. You weren't taught by your mother or your father much about sex and perversion and all that. And there are all sorts of books you can buy that deal with these things under the guise, you know, of just giving you knowledge. Well, that's as old as the Garden of Eden. Eve fell for that old deception. You remember what we're told in Genesis 3 and verse 6? The old serpent sidled up to her and he said, Have you noticed that tree over there? Yes, God said, We shall not eat it, neither touch it. The day you do, you shall die. He said, well, look at it. Here, look at this picture. It won't hurt you. It'll give you knowledge. You'll be like God. And we read, she looked and saw it was something to be desired. And something that would be delicious as she partook of it. What is the exact wording? I like the King James on that. Some of these other versions may not give the force of it. Oh yes, and when the woman saw through the eye gate that the tree was good for food, nothing wrong with that except wrong tree, 
But look at this. And it was pleasant to the eyes. Something to be desired. To make you wise. And there are ministers who fall into that same snare of buying Playboy magazine, penthouse, pornographic literature, or witnessing movies so they will become more knowledgeable in order, they say, so that I can help these people that are caught up into these awful sins and perversions. And as often as not, they end up with the same problems. Wonder why. I mean, anyone ought to know, if you want to know about the evils of alcohol and nicotine, you don't have to go smoke out back here and buy you a bottle of 80 proof to find out. You see, that's the mistake that Adam and Eve made here in Genesis 3, is that they tried to acquire knowledge of good and evil through their sense experience. And that's where they missed it. They didn't need to know anything about evil. But as soon as they disobeyed God, they learned that that was the basis of all evil, disobeying God. So in summary, on the first area, we need to discern between the works of the flesh and the work of demons. Then when you discern which it is, you deal with it either through self-control or through deliverance and self-control, because it'll do no good to get delivered if you don't exercise self-control. How many have we prayed for more than once because they got delivered and didn't exercise self-control? And then it isn't enough to know which it is and how to deal with it. You have to know that you must deal with the source, and that's the mind. And the way you get to the mind is through the eye gate, through the ear gate, basically. Now, a second area I want to move into tonight... And that is the fear of God versus the spirit of fear. Because we're always dealing with people who have fears, who have phobias. So the fear of God versus the spirit of fear. Now, as you know, the Bible repeatedly points out the value of a good, wholesome fear of the Lord. You know the passages. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In fact, right here in Malachi... You notice twice in verse 16, he said, They that feared the Lord. The Lord's going to write their name in the book of remembrance. He says it twice. They that fear the Lord. And then down in verse 2 of chapter 4. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. How do you like that? Healing if you fear the Lord. See, there's a sermon for somebody. And so over and over, we could just spend time running proof texts, but you've heard them many, many times, that the Bible encourages us to fear the Lord. But then over in 2 Timothy 1.7, a passage again we're familiar with and won't have to turn to, there we're informed that some types of fear are a spirit. For God has not given you the spirit of fear. Now obviously God expects us to be able to discern the difference. Between the fear of the Lord and a spirit of fear. And the Lord is a spirit, so the spirit of the Lord fearing him are a spirit of fear from Satan. He expects us to discern and know the distinction that's to be made between the fear of the Lord, which speaks of possessing a right attitude toward God. The fear of the Lord speaks of possessing a right attitude toward the Lord. But a spirit of fear speaks of being possessed by a wrong entity. One is possessing a right attitude. The other is being possessed by a wrong entity. Well, how can you discern the difference here? Well, let me give you two ways to discern whether or not the fear you have is of the Lord, from the Lord, about the Lord, or some other source that is defeating you. Well, two ways. First of all, does the spirit that requires you to do or not do something require you to do that or not do it? That's something that doesn't line up with the Word of God. Does what the spirit that's placing fear upon you have you to do or not do something that doesn't line up with the Word? That's one way. 
to discern. The second, does it minister bondage or liberty? What you're being impressed to do or not do. Now, there's nothing wrong with the fear of the Lord. We've had teaching on it. In fact, you'll be surprised if you'll get in a concordance how many times we're told to fear the Lord. You better fear the Lord. Overcomers fear the Lord. That's why they overcome. People who don't fear the Lord don't try to overcome. But anyway, those two tests. Does the Spirit try to get you to do something out of line with the Word? And secondly, with what you're being told to do or not do? Does fear come along with it in the sense of there's no peace, it's bondage, and it's not liberty? You see, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, instructs you, admonishes you, and tells you to do something or not do something, and He's always speaking to people who listen, when He tells you to do something or not do something or admonish you, there is a holy fear present. You've heard from the Lord. He said, stop in your tracks. Now consider what you just said or what you're getting ready to do or not do. Are you excusing while well, you're too tired to pray or too tired to study the Word or whatever? Whatever it is He's dealing, you know the Spirit's talking and there is a fear, not a trembling always, it can be that, but a fear. But when it's a spirit of fear, there is not that inward peace that will come through obeying what the Spirit who's talking to you will minister when you obey that. In other words, when the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, there's a holy fear present, but you get a release in your spirit when you obey Him. You don't keep saying, have I done enough or have I done it right? Oh, I'll tell you, how many people have come for deliverance? I mean, they are so busy in religious works trying to please the Lord that they've missed the Lord. And it's a spirit of fear driving them on and on and on. Have I done enough? Have I done it right? What else can I do? I generally tell them, quit doing anything and get settled down to the fact that, that isn't faith, that's fear. And so while there is a healthy fear present when the Holy Spirit is directing us, I get that when I read the Word. I have a holy... Respect and fear for what God is saying there. And as you meditate upon it, and you see the way He dealt with Israel, and He didn't make any exceptions for His wife, His chosen people. And we just better tread softly, He tells us in the New Testament, or He would just set us aside like He did Israel. Now, of course, we know here He's going to bring her back one day, but that doesn't change the fact that she suffered terribly like no other nation down through history because of her disobedience. You see, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, there's a holy fear present that motivates you to obey God because of your fear of disobedience, but not just because of fear of disobedience, but fear of displeasing your Heavenly Father that's done so much for you. Just the fear that I might displease Him if I don't hearken to what He's saying to do or not do. But when it's a religious, deceiving spirit of fear... You will be led to do things out of line with the Word of God. And you will have no peace or satisfaction or release after you obey. That's how you can discern. If you've had to deal with so many people as we have, you'll see some people get no release through wearing women's clothing. They're not really free. They're not released. They're doing it out of fear, not fear of God because he says a woman shouldn't wear that which pertains to a man. That is why they're doing it. And they fear displeasing him as well as disobeying him. But they're moved with fear. If I don't do it, I can't come to faith assembly. We never said that, but things like that motivate people to take actions. There are people who get in here that the Lord shows they need deliverance from cigarettes. We don't stand at the door and... Smell people, their breath, that is, as they come in. And that's not hard to detect if you're a nicotine addict. You've lost all sense of smell for so long that you think, well, I had that cigarette an hour ago, or was it 30 minutes ago? Well, at least 30 minutes ago, and I've been eating mints ever since. Friends, you can't get it out of your skin. It's in your pores, your hair, your clothes. <laughs> you stink. <laughs> It was not until I quit smoking for 18 years that I see how awful 
I must have smelled to people, especially in a restaurant where they go to eat and try to smell. You have to smell food to savor it. I realize people gulp down this. <laughs> I'm going to overcome the temptation. I won't get into the food business, but anyway. And if you quit smoking because you fear cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer, because so many are dying of it, that's a spirit of fear. You want to fear the Lord enough that you don't want to displease Him. You want to obey Him. You don't want to pollute the temple of the Holy Spirit. Read 1 Corinthians 6, and you are polluting your body with your alcohol and nicotine. The devil doesn't want you to hear these things. He doesn't want you to be delivered, because... If you hear the truth, then you'll find out the Holy Spirit doesn't like beer and the plumbing in his house. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't like the smell of nicotine in his rooms. He doesn't like you to pollute his temple with all of those microbes and bugs they call miracle drugs and their adverse effects and so on. So if there's always a driving, a driving, a driving to do or not do something, that isn't the Lord because He doesn't minister fear. Now that distinction between godly fear and a spirit of fear is made by Jesus in a significant passage, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, which deals with the same thing. I think we'll look at Luke 21 because He says something else in connection with it that is pertinent to what we're talking about. The difference between the spirit of fear and the fear of the Lord. And so many confuse the two. They think they're obeying the Lord when they're being driven by a spirit of fear. Luke 21, verses 25 and 26. Jesus speaking of the times that are soon coming upon this world as far as this generation. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, those things are promised, predicted, prophesied. Go over to verse 9. Look what he said to us. But when you shall hear of these things, like wars and commotions, be not terrified. Don't be afraid. He's saying to us, revelations concerning the terrible judgments coming upon this earth, not only from the Word of God, but coming through prophecies and visions, are not intended to minister fear to overcomers, as it will to those when they begin to witness these commotions, those upon the earth. And a fear of what's coming upon this earth, a fear of atomic attack, a fear of earthquakes and pestilences and famines and all of these things, if that's in your heart, that's a spirit of fear. Because he tells us, don't be terrified by those things. There's no way to describe what's coming upon this earth. Earth. He speaks of wars and commotions and the sound of the sea. He's talking about typhoons and things that will even doubtless hit America. And you know all of the increase that we're witnessing of floods and tornadoes and earthquakes. And California is going to fall into the sea, parts of it at least. And he says, don't be afraid when you see this. Don't be terrified, because he knows the world will. He says their hearts will fail with fear. Because if you're afraid then He can't minister that peace to you. He should be ministering peace to you, even as He tells you of these terrible things that are going to fall on the earth. Your heart should be at peace. Mine is. I say time and again, thank God that I'm a Christian. Thank God I'm under the blood. Thank God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you hear about all of these terrible things happening, you know, on the radio, like in Atlanta, about 30 colored children, you know, murdered and assaulted and all of that. And you could live right in the midst of that, you see, and not be afraid if you have the faith message in your heart. 
If it's a spirit of fear, you'll be terrified right along with the world and people. Like one woman, she was a Methodist. I was speaking in a Baptist church years ago. I was preaching on the second advent and, you know, events to take place in connection with it. Had us over for dinner and then I got a lecture, as you often do, when you're invited out to eat rather than eating and enjoying it. Another story, but... Oh, don't preach on the second coming. Don't preach on the second advent. It's so disturbing and distressing. Well, I wondered what she had to fear. I wasn't afraid. I'm looking forward to it. And all I can figure out, if you're afraid of it, it's either a spirit of fear or you're not ready, or both. So it will cause you, if a spirit of fear, to be terrified just by hearing these things over the radio or reading them in the Word. And secondly, it will move you to take actions that are out of line with the Word of God. And you see that all the time. People will do things because of fear. Like, here's a letter I got in the mail. And he said, I'm hearing these, you know, prophecies and people who are having visions of how the Chinese one day soon are going to have missiles pointed toward the USA. You know, everybody's looking to Russia. But I don't know of a single vision, and there have been many in this end time, given to the servants of God about Russia attacking us. But it's the Chinese they see in vision, walking the streets of America and blood running in the streets and so forth and so on. He said, in view of all these visions coming, and a number of people have had them, and some you would know if we mentioned. He said, I think it would be good, good common sense, not to be in the USA when these missiles begin to fall. He says, I don't think that's fear, although it's possible. Well, yes, it is fear. He said, I just think it's good sense, not fear, but it is possible, I'm afraid. He said, do you know of a good spirit-filled Bible school in Canada? <laughs> he said, would you pray for me? He said, I may just become a Canadian citizen. He said, you might want a visa yourself. Now, that's the spirit of fear. I didn't rush out to get a visa. I heard about the visions before he did. And from all looks of things, you see, we armed Russia. We gave away military secrets and what we didn't give her in the ways of technology. You see, if you send her a shipload of grain, you're helping her survive so she can come against Israel or you. But anyway, we finally armed her. We had the atom bomb. Now she's got it. You know what? Those were Democrats, those old bad Democrats. You know what the Republicans are doing? So you can see we don't play favorites. They are arming the Chinese who are really the threat and will be the threat against America. They're giving them military technology, know-how, and equipment. It just came over the radio. Of course, their rationale is that they arm the Chinese and that becomes a counterbalance to a Russian threat against us. But it won't. The Chinese will wipe out Russia and then come into America. This is a spirit of fear. Does this young man and any of you think that when the Chinese walk through America and the blood runs in the streets, they're going to stop at the Canadian border? Well, they wouldn't stop if there was the Chinese wall there. The wall of China. You've seen pictures of that, I know. They'll take the North American continent. Oh, but praise God. The promise is He will deliver. Spare those who fear Him and give them discernment so they'll know who's got the truth and who doesn't have the truth and who's serving the Lord with their ministry and who's serving self or the devil. He'll give you discernment if you'll fear Him. And fear Him means obey Him. You cannot sit under this light and then disobey Him and expect God to spare you. And so we're saying if it's a spirit of fear, it will cause you to do things. Take actions out of line with the Word of God, like storing, stockpiling food. You've heard of that one before. Well, here's a charismatic pamphlet advertising. Dehydrated foods. And the title of it is, Are You Prepared for the Coming Worldwide Food Crisis? And the foods they are selling you, Revelation Foods. 
They got a revelation all right. This is charismatic. They're going to make a profit off of your fears that they're ministering to you. We're living in almost unprecedented times, especially for our nation. These are, and look at all these biblical terms, these are apocalyptic days punctuated by drought, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Everywhere there's political unrest and food shortages and on and on and on. I don't want to read all that, but it gets down to how God wrought salvation through Noah. He is the God of salvation who prepared Noah to save his people from the flood and he raised up a Joseph to save them from the famine. Now you see, we're going to use Bible for this. There's a famine coming. Jesus just said there was. They're right on with Scripture. But as Noah saved his family from the flood, Joseph saved his people from the famine. You remember, we don't have to go back to Sunday school to learn how. The seven years of famine, Joseph interpreted the dream the Pharaoh had and... So they stockpiled food for seven years. And so that's the basis for why we should do it. So God promised not to send a flood again. So we don't need any more Noah's. But we do need some Joseph's. Buy our Revelation foods. How much should I store? Well, the ideal is a year's supply. If you're living by yourself, that would still be a few hundred dollars. But if you've got a family, friends, you think insurance will take your money. This insurance will take all the rest of it. How much a year's supply? And you ought to read what, you know, a few cans of this, 50, 60, 80 dollars. And how long will it keep? Well, no one knows, but buy it anyway. <laughs> Why should I buy it now? Well, dummy, because we're selling it and we need your money to make a profit. <laughs> no, they didn't say that. That's just what they are doing. Why should I buy now? Because it's available now. The threat of food shortages and economic crisis is increasing rapidly and you can strengthen your family's security. You can strengthen your family's security by storing up now. Last year food prices increased so buy now. Before the prices increase more. It is better to be ready years too soon, but we don't know how long it will keep. It is better to be ready years too soon than to be one day late. What wisdom. Have these people charismatic Christians? I mean, they're calling themselves in. Have they never read the Bible they profess to believe? Can't you see that action is totally out of line with the Word of God? Matthew six nineteen to 34 He says five times, don't do that. Don't buy Revelation foods. Don't store up. Take no thought, He says, for your food, what you shall eat. Didn't He know times like this were going to come? Well, He just told us in Luke 21 they're coming. He Himself said that. And what did He say? Before I tell you what's going to happen, don't be terrified. Take no thought. If I fed Elijah with meat and bread every day and out of a running, babbling, cool brook for three years, I can feed you. Have they never read the Bible? Revelation foods indeed. They got a revelation all right. But it was from a deceiving spirit of fear and they're trying to minister that fear to you. We see that's out of line with the word. Matthew 6, Luke 21, 9, Revelation 3, 10. After he ascended into heaven, he said, don't be afraid while he was on earth. Now he's up at the right hand of God. He said to the overcomer, I will preserve you from the trial, the great tribulation that's coming upon this earth. Amen. Revelation 3, 10. Mark it down. Memorize it. 2 Timothy 1, 7. He said, Paul, go tell them, I don't minister fear to their hearts. I haven't given them a spirit of fear, but of power, stable-mindedness, and love. Proverbs twenty nine twenty five: The fear of man will bring a snare, but whosoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Hallelujah. And he isn't talking about just fearing what man will do to you, because we've already learned no point in being afraid of that. But don't fear what they say to you, like stockpile food or flee to Canada 
Well, if I was going to flee somewhere, it wouldn't be to Canada. Because they'll take the whole North American continent. They don't know anything about boundaries. They'll go right through. You have to stop and get a permit to get into Canada. And if you take a amateur radio, it used to be you had to declare it and some things you couldn't take in. And if you didn't have the bill of sale and all of that, and you get over and go out the other way, you can't get out. They're not going to stop for that nonsense. They'll just take over. Don't fear what people say as well as what some people say they can do if you don't follow the crowd. You know, do what's popular. And if what they say doesn't line up with the Word of God, if it ministers bondage and fear, then reject it and rebuke it and resist it because it's the devil. It's not the Lord.